joining us at On the Menu Effective Communication. Uh, my name is Amanda Ronan. I'm the Director of Programs for the Research Triangle Foundation. This is our third year doing On the Menu. Each month, it is a different topic, a different expert from the community to share insight on helping you get to that next level of business, whatever that level of business might be. So today we're talking communication. We've got some people in person, and then we have a bunch of folks on Zoom as well. Um, so a little bit of housekeeping there. Um, everyone on Zoom, you are on mute, but if you need anything at all, please just type it in the chat, send me a message, Amanda wrote in on there. If you're having issues with audio, just let us know and we'll do our best to fix that for you. Um, hold your questions till the end, people in the room and on Zoom. Um, we will have time at the end for questions and answers. Of course, if there's something during that you need further clarification on, please ask it. Um, folks in Zoom, type it in chat and I'll ask it for you. Um, but for the most part, Tracy will be leaving time at the end for those questions. Before I get started, I did want to give a big shout out to Alta Ren, who are our sponsors for this series. Um, we provided our lunch. We do have some swag items too for those that are joining virtually. So if you'd like something sent to you, just shoot me a DM as well, and I'll send those out via mail. Um, before I introduce our speaker, we do just want to know who's in the room, both the Zoom room and the actual room. So for those in person, I'm going to pass around the mic, and if you could say your name and your industry. Those on Zoom, type it in chat, please. And I'm going to sanitize everything. <laughs> The turn over here. I'm Cheryl um, from Gotcha Photography. Cheryl Gotcha. And I'm from Gotcha Photography. Evan Fairclaw. Melody Jaros, and I'm in user experience research. <laughs> Hi, I'm Charlotte Glam and I'm in finance. Jacqueline Williamson, I'm in commercial real estate. I'm Rebel Sumner and I'm retired. <laughs> You've got the best job. <laughs> Kevin Cypher and I own RTP.studio and do real estate photography. Mm -hmm. Just say your names for industry. Margie Swain Brooks, medical information. All right. Thank you, everyone in the room, for introducing themselves to the chat. I hope y'all are introducing yourselves as well. Um, I am going to turn it over to our speaker, Tracy. So, just a little bit about her. Tracy assists visionary business owners and corporate executives to develop a solution-based orientation to leadership and change in personal and work-related environments. She helps those in leadership positions learn and practice better communication, resolution strategies, decision-making, and waiting during times of change when the stakes are high. With unique strengths in translating both verbal and nonverbal language, Tracy can help identify and apply effective tools and approaches to zero in on core issues and challenges that are creating an, in, an Ill, inability to meet desired objectives and outcomes. We'll pass it over to you now, Tracy. We are here to hear you talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. It is so nice to be back with people again. Um, this is my second in-house event. Um, so thank you so much for being here. Good to be here. And thank you for those of you who are online. So communication, probably one of the most important things in general, but especially as we've entered the times that we're in, communication has changed dramatically in the sense that we're now doing most of our communication virtually. Um, we as human beings, however, biologically speaking, are primed and, and we developed to be in person in our communications. And so today we're gonna talk about some very important things that lead to good communication. And what I like to do is in my work is get to the core of things. A lot of the times we're used to dealing with kind of the superficial symptomatic things and that's there's nothing wrong with that but if we're just managing the symptoms we're not getting to the core of what causes the symptoms then we keep kind of having to deal with the same symptoms um so one of the things that i really want to focus on uh, and i actually need to remember once i did a ted talk Thank you. 
So basically, we're going to be talking about communication, how to, thank you so much, how to have effective communication um, and build connections both online and in person. But there's three things I really wanted to talk about specifically when it comes to the core of what breeds good communication. And those words are trust, rapport, and connection. As human beings, in order to have an ability to feel secure, right? in having those communications, whether they're simple communications or more challenging communications. We really tend to lean into those where we have trust, rapport, and connection that's already been built. So when we think about how things are these days and, and, and how quick you know, we, can, we can communicate, right, and how we're communicating, are we building trust, rapport, and connection? That's the key. So as we go through the information that I'm gonna present to you today, I'm, I'm just kind of setting the stage for that so that you know that those are really the things that we want to be establishing. Um, how we position ourselves, you know, the right words to say, all of that comes almost secondary to our intention to build those three things in our communication. So as often as the case, I love to start with data, right? Because we love data. Data is something we can hang our hat on. Um, and in this case, this is uh, some data that came originally out of from 2016, I believe, a woman by the name of Carissa Silver, who was a behavioral scientist, was really interesting in some trends that she was seeing in the dating scene. And so she did this, this study, and what came out of it was this theory that she called the detachment theory. And she took that theory and she started to then say, I wonder where else these trends are showing up. Uh, detachment, what she was really studying originally was before it became uh, trending known as ghosting. That was really what she was looking at, is this point at which people choose to detach without communicating, right? To just pull away without saying anything. Right? And in 2019, she took her research and she went into the workplace because she was interested to see if this, this thing now with, a, with a, a term called ghosting was showing up there in communication as well. And she found that the data was almost exactly the same as what she had found originally. And so this concept, detachment theory, is in the quick, and, and some of the, the, what she theorized is the quick and unconscious. And what I mean by that is, and what she meant by that was, in today's world where more of our communications are quick and unconscious, right? How easy is it to just text someone, right? How easy is it to DM, right? And in our environments where we're expecting, not only from ourselves or others, more achievement, right? Like we need to get more done. We need to check more boxes in a day. We don't have time to build those connections or, or build that communication in a way that maybe back in the old days, as they say, you know, where we, we could spend the time really communicating fully, right? And so this idea of quick and fast has led to unconscious. Right? Because we can't be conscious when we're just flying by the seat of our pants and, and kind of throwing information out there con conscious, um, um, con constant, right? And constant. All right, so what she found, and I'm not going to go into the details of the research, but if you see the largest bar there, that represents 85%. And the question there was, how many people, you see people polled, how many people have consciously chosen to ghost someone? And out of all the people polled, 85% said they had. Consciously, like that's a high percentage. That's meaning to say, okay, I'm just going to detach at this point, this juncture, whatever that juncture was. Now, 65% said that the reasoning for this was a fear of confrontation, right? So, out of that 85% that it chose to go, 65% that the reason said that the reason they did ghost was fear of confrontation. I just want to make a little side note on this because words are powerful. The words we feed ourselves becomes the meaning we give something. And many times people call something confrontational that's merely challenging. We use the word challenge and the word confrontation. It sends different signals to the brain, right? We, we know that we move towards pleasure and away from pain. If we call something confrontational, are we going to naturally biologically want to move towards it or away from it, right? Away from it. 
But if we call it challenging, how many people in the room have had challenging situations with someone? And by working through that situation, it brought them closer to that person. Yeah, that has also been studied, right? That's what happens. When we take the time to lean into and communicate, even in challenging situations, we actually build more trust, rapport, and connection, right? Not to say we can only do it in challenge, but so this is the thing, is if we're telling ourselves that this opportunity, this challenging opportunity is confrontational, we're gonna move away from it, right? We're gonna detach from it. And by detaching from it, we're gonna also detach from our opportunity to build trust, rapport, and connection. So these are the things that I like to kind of lay out because as we move forward, you know, what is, why is this important ultimately in our communications with one another? Well, it's important because intention impacts outcome, right? If our intention is to move away, what kind of outcome is that going to breed, right? If our intention is to lean in and build trust, rapport, and connection, what outcome is that going to lead to? Right? So regardless of how we end up communicating, it all starts with our intention. And I'll tell you one thing, if our intention is strong and clear towards rapport, trusting and, and connection, then our words will follow suit. Intention is powerful, right? Intention really is like our GPS mechanism, right? If we put into that GPS mechanism a certain direction, that is the direction we'll go. And if we're telling ourselves in our head that something's you know, we need to detach from it or it's, it's scary or we have fear of it, we're actually leading ourselves down the exact opposite direction as what we want as humans, which is to build trust with our connection. All right, so I wanted to actually start by three reasons why we tend to have ineffective communication, right? Ineffective communication is, is again, intentional or unintentional, usually it's unconscious going into our communications with three certain things in mind that I find are not helpful. The first one is what I call transactional communication. This is when we go into a communication only focusing on exchanging information or receiving information. Who has been the receiver of an email by a boss or somebody else that was completely transactional? Something like, do you have those numbers? We need to get the report in. Anybody been on the receiving end? Maybe not in work, it can be personal. But when somebody was communicating transactionally, how'd you feel, good or bad? Bad. Not great. Annoyed. Right, not great, right? And interestingly enough, when we also serve transactional communication, we don't feel good either. Because guess what? We're not focusing on trust, report, and connection. We're focused just on giving or receiving information. Right, so not an effective intention. Second is having a gender or an assumption. Let me unpack that a little bit because this is a little bit more nuanced. It's otherwise known as expectational sharing. Okay, so having an agenda, I might go in and I'm I'm you know leading a meeting at work and I have an agenda. I have boxes I need to check, and I'm in control mode. We are going to get those boxes checked in the next 30 minutes if it's if if I can do nothing else. What am I focused on? Well, first of all, I'm probably focused more transactional, right? But I'm also leaving out opportunities for what comes when we are open in a sharing uh, environment, right? So if we're in a meeting and there's an opportunity for people to share different things that can really actually be beneficial to what we're working on, but I don't give time for that because I have this agenda and we're gonna meet with the agenda, right? It's not gonna allow for true yeah, and trust, rapport, and connection, but also, too, it's going to probably leave out opportunities to bring in information that is really important, right? The second assumption, all right, so let's say I need to discuss something with Bob in a different department. I've never interacted with Bob before, but Claire in my department has interacted with Bob, and Claire is like, oh, geez, I'm so sorry. You have to interact with Bob, and he's a dog. Okay, good luck with that. If I go into that interaction with Bob with the assumption that he's going to be a pill, how do you think that GPS is geared, right, towards Bob being difficult, right? How is that unconsciously positioning me as I respond to Bob? Probably not favorably, right? So what we want to remember is, is even if Claire, I can't take back what Claire just said to me, unfortunately, Claire said it. 
But we want to make sure that when we're going into our engagements, even if I had a hard time with Bob last week, I don't want to assume that it'll be like that again. And this is really hard as human beings because we learn as we go, right? We tend to take what we've learned and apply it to the next interaction. But when we go in with an assumption of how something's going to go, it leaves out our ability for our brain to pick up anything other than what we've discussed. Right? So if there's information being shared, right, if somebody's trying to actually build trust, rapport, and connection with me, if I'm expecting something other than that, that's exactly what I'm going to experience. Okay? And third, avoidance. Right? Ghosting. Right? When we actually be more like, how's avoidance? An approach to communication. Well, it is. It's the choice not to communicate. <laughs> right? So avoidance is not at all effective in any case. Now, sometimes we may need to take a step back, right? We need, we need to take a pause, right? But avoiding full out, and I'm going to get into why in a minute, is not effective way to communicate. Even what you feel. Oh, they know. I ghosted him. He must know how I feel. Right? It's actually not as effective as if is if we lead into that communication. So what do we do instead? These are the approaches that I recommend instead. Transactional communication not effective, relational communication effective. Right, this is focusing on building rapport. Good salesperson people have this down path, right? How do you get through a door? You build trust, rapport, and connection, right? And it isn't to say that we do this just to get in the door, right? This isn't manipulative. This is human behavior, right? We want to build these things in our lives. We want to build these things for our communications. So being able to start now, so that transactional email that I might've gotten from my boss, and it's like, when can I get the numbers for that report? Might've gotten something like this. Hey, Tracy, happy Monday. Hope you had a great weekend. I know last Friday we were talking about getting those numbers for the report. I'm just wondering when I can expect them. And I hope you have a great day. Looking forward to hearing from you. It takes an extra two to three seconds. Okay? But it's building that rapport. What happens when we don't have rapport and, and trust and connection is we have insecurity. And it leads to things like hashtag the great resignation. People are leaving their jobs like never before because they don't feel secure and valued. Right? Why? Because there is a lack of trust and rapport and connection okay? in those workplaces. Being curious and intentional is the opposite of being expectational right? and having an agenda or an assumption. Right? When we are curious and intentional, we're open and neutral. So even if I heard from Claire that Bob was a pill, I can think to myself, okay, well, that was her interpretation of her interactions with Bob. Maybe Bob was having a bad day. Maybe it'll be different for me, but either way, I'm going to be open and neutral. And I'm going to set my intentional beacon on being open and neutral and just see what I get. Right? That is going to inform the way I interact with Bob very differently than if I went in expectationally uh, in, in terms of what I heard from, from somebody else. And then finally, this is probably one of my favorites because in order for us, DEI, does everybody know what DEI stands for? We should all know what DEI stands for at this point in time. Diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? Also buzzwords right now. In order to have diversity, we need different perspectives. Equity is about being seen as equal as human beings we are. And inclusion means everybody has a place at the table, but this is the key thing. If I make a place at the table, but you don't take it, how good is that place at the table? When we don't use our valuable voice, we don't know that if there's something I need to say now, it doesn't mean we don't work for our emotions, frame it properly, and again, the word respectful is there for a reason. Come back and communicate, but when we choose not to, the value of our voice is lost, not only to ourselves. If I don't let my voice be valuable, that means I'm devaluing my own voice. And if I don't speak my voice and put it out there, what I have to say is not of value to others. So if somebody can make room at the table for you, but if you take that face at the table, then it's worth nothing. So knowing that you are valuable, knowing that what you have to say is valuable, it's just about framing it in a way that's going to be effective, but not saying it isn't an option. Finding a way to say it. And if I can't make that any more explicit, I don't know how I can be more direct because this is what we're missing. 
right? We're making room at the table, but not everybody's taking it. And sometimes it takes time and sometimes we need support. And I'm not saying that's that's a secondary conversation. What I'm saying is if the, if the opportunity is given, take it, right? Because it is valuable. All right, so let's look at these side by side. Transactional communication versus relational. This is exchanging, focusing on simply exchanging information versus building rapport. <coughs> Having an agenda or an assumption versus focusing uh, on intentional curiosity. This is expectational sharing versus open neutral sharing. Finally, avoidance versus using our valuable voice. Fearing confrontation or lack of feeling like we don't have the capability to communicate, even if we communicate. Anybody know who Brene Brown is? I, uh, I know, love Brene Brown. I, she talks about using, it doesn't matter if your voice is shaking and you feel like you're gonna lose your lunch, right? Use your voice, speak up, find a way forward because what you have to say matters. Knowing that it matters and if you don't engage, there is no rapport or trust or connection to be built, right? So you need to be present for that to happen. All right, so when we go into communications, there are three steps or three considerations that I like to always think about. The first one is get right with yourself. <laughs> Right, check yourself. Um, and what I what I think about this always are three simple questions. Right, this is what, how, and why. Before going into a communication, I always and this is something when I work with clients, um, I work with with leaders. They communicate a lot. <laughs> Their communications have a lot of impact. Right, so I teach them to think about these three things first. What do you want to communicate? Right, get clear on that. How do you want to communicate it? How do you want it to land? Right? Again, intentional begin. How do I want this to be received? How do I want to be seen? Right? How do I want to be experienced by others? And then finally, why? That last one can be so important because you can be all up in, you know, I'm ready to what I want to say and I know how I want to say it, but it's like, why am I saying this? And that can actually sometimes stop us from saying the wrong thing, right? When we ask that final question, why? Right? Why am I saying this? What outcome am I going? Am I going for rapport, trust, and connection? Or am I going for just being right? right? How many times do we say things because we just want to be right? Um, look good, be safe, be comfortable. Right? So that's all ego. And again, there's nothing wrong with ego. Ego's gotten a bad rap. But when it comes to communication, we don't want to be speaking from ego. Um, so asking those questions, that's getting right internally with what you want to Step number two, as so you've gotten all right with yourself, now it's all about the other person or people who you're communicating with. This is listening from an open, active state, right? Again, you know, realizing that what you have to say is only part of the story, right? There are the other people with whom you are engaging and communicating. And so being, being, being present with, with where they are and things is important. Being curious and asking for clarification. Do you know what happens? To the brain when we don't have information, we fill in the gaps, right? So if somebody says something and we're gonna immediately give meaning to that, right? So this is how it goes. We have no control over something that happens. But once something happens, we think about that thing and we give it meaning. We have control over the meaning we give it. That meaning causes us to feel a certain way about that thing, right? Because we're giving a certain meaning, we also choose how we feel about it. That is within our control. That feeling leads to action, again, under our control, and those actions lead to outcomes, again, under our control. So when something happens, we may not have control over it, but everything else that happens after that, we have control. It's our choice, right? So making sure that we ask for clarification because our brain will fill in the information we don't have. And if we misjudge, a, a communication and we don't ask for clarification, that's on us. And remembering whatever, whatever is communicated is always about the person communicating it, right? It's sometimes very hard when somebody is attacking you directly and we've been getting a lot of that, right? A lot of that in social media, a lot of that in the world, you know, attack, attack, a lot of polarization going on right now. Not a lot of trust, rapport and connection being focused on, but it's not about you. No matter what someone says to you, it's always about them. Even if they directly say it's about you. You can't, there's a difference between you made me feel and I feel. Somebody can trigger you, 
right? But nobody can reach inside of you and make you feel anything. You choose to feel the way you feel, and that's based on the meaning you're giving the circumstance. And you can always change the story, right? One of my favorite books, and I've been a little, I have so much here with the flicker and the, you know, it's like how many can you have your belly and walk at the same time? One of the books I uh, want to mention to you is one of Brene Brown's books. And for those of you who are Brene Brown lovers, you probably are very familiar with this book, The Brave in the Wilderness. When we talk about trust, rapport, and connection, it speaks to something far deeper, right? Which is our belongingness. This is about her research and belonging. We want to belong, right? When we don't belong, right, all sorts of things happen. We feel like we, we're going to be cast out. In the olden days, if you're cast out of your tribe, you die. Right? So human beings have a deep need to belong. And so building that trust, rapport, and connection is a way to belong. When we don't belong, I'll tell you one thing. One of the deepest core wounds, I see it as a coach, but I have a lot of friends in, um, in the therapy arena, right? So, so counselors, therapists. One of the deepest wounds human beings struggle with is abandonment. When we ghost people, we're abandoning them. When we're ghosted, we feel abandoned. So the more that we don't focus on trust, rapport and connection, the more we might be leaving ourselves up for engagements that cause abandonment feelings, right? We don't wanna do that. So this talks a lot about that if you're interested in that work at all. The other book too, Louder Than Words, this is by Claude Henry using your valuable voice. If you're learning, if you're one of those people who does is challenged with speaking up, um, sharing, sharing your truth, this is a great book. He talks about how we use your words powerfully and how powerful your words truly are. And so that's another one louder than words. And the one I wanted to bring up here on this slide is by Don Miguel Ruiz. Has anybody heard of The Four Agreements? It's one of my favorite books. It's been around for a really long time. Um, Four agreements that if you keep in mind in life, your life will become smoother <laughs> if you can actually practice them. But they are the impeccable with your word. Words are powerful. As much as we say sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me, that's not true. People are wounded every day by words. Right? So we need to be impeccable with our words, not in only what we say and how we say it, right? Making sure that if we say we're going to do something, we do it, we follow through, and if we can't, we communicate that, but also the words we choose when we communicate. Don't take anything personally, because again, what did I say? It's not about you. <laughs> as much as we want to think the world revolves around us, it's all about that other person communicating it. And don't make assumptions. Clarify, clarify, clarify. And finally, always do your best. Yeah. Can you say the name of the book and hold it up? Yes. So, yeah, Don Miguel Ruiz is the author, and it's The Four Agreements, is the book. This has been around for a very long time. It's really basic and practical. I love books that are less than 200 pages and are either in parable form or really basic like this. Okay. Okay. The other quote, louder than words, louder than words. What was the author's name? Uh, Todd Henry. So, always do your best means that no matter how someone else is acting, you can act in integrity with the person you want to be. Okay. Always do your best. When I was a little kid, I remember I was probably about five years old, and I was on a, uh, a camping trip with my family, and my mom had taken me into a public restroom uh, to go to the bathroom. And when we were in there, in one of the big stalls, uh, my mom had some toilet paper and was kind of cleaning up the stall. And I was like, hey, mom, what are you doing? And she says, honey, any time in life, you always want to leave things better than you found them. And I'll never forget that message because it, it has lasted my entire life. It's something where it's like always doing my best is always leaving things better than I found them. So in engagements, in communications, in anything you can do, whether it's picking up, I'm not always saying, especially in today's world, we don't want to do that or wear gloves if you do, um, but find ways to make the environment better. Your communications are a great way to start. Finally, the third step in the steps to consider when communicating is what we're back to ourselves now. It's all about us now again. And this is about taking responsibility for our part of communications. A lot of times when communications are challenging, especially, we want to, again, disengage. But even if we don't disengage, there's a lot of finger pointing oftentimes. It's very easy to do that. If somebody has triggered us in some way, and, and you know, it's, it's very easy to say, you know, you're making this difficult for me. But remembering that if we're engaged in that, in that engagement, 
we're a part of it and we have to take personal responsibility for whatever part that we're playing. Right, so staying in integrity with who we are, some of the best ways to do this are I statements. And some of my favorite I statements, especially when we are in challenging conversations, are, you know, there's something I want to communicate to you because this relationship matters to me. Are you open to hearing what I have to share? It's a great intro into anything that you may be wanting to, to clarify or clear. Or, or, or even talk about for the first time with somebody that might be more challenging. Because when people know that your intention is to build trust, rapport, and connection, when you say specifically, this relationship matters to me, that's why I'm saying this, it's setting the stage not for maybe the difficult stuff you're about to say, but for why you're saying it, right? And if people know why you're saying something, it's oftentimes easier for them to hear what you have to say when it is more challenging. Right? So I statements are great. Um, two great books for this, again, bringing my entire library with me today, is The Power of Ted. This is one of my favorite books of all time, The Power of Ted. It talks about empowerment and disempowerment dynamics. Um, it goes back to work that started in the late 1960s by a man by the name of Dr. Stephen Cartman. He created, he was a psychologist, he created what's called the Cartman Triangle of drama, drama dynamics. And he was trying to communicate how we interact when we're in ego with one another and we create situations of disempowerment. And he came up with the roles of victim, I think is either per persecutor or perpetrator and rescuer and how all those roles lead to more disempowerment dynamic. Um, and then, this book was written in the 1980s by David Emerald. He came and took Cartman's work. He created the antithesis uh, dynamic, which he calls TED, the empowerment dynamic, uh, not TED Talks. It has no affiliation with TED. <laughs> um, and that was where, instead of being the victim, he teaches people how to, to frame things so that you can be the creator of your own world, right? You can take full responsibility for what you create. The rescuer role became coach. And the, and the persecutor role became challenger. And so this work is, is probably at the heart of most of what I do at First Book Minds to teach them how we are creating disempowerment and how that is leading to more communications that create more disempowerment and how they can change that. Um, and then the other book is referenced up there, Renee Brown's book, Fear to Lead. This is where she talks about the rumble language. Right, so rumble language, and, and these, again, more challenging conversations, but clarifying as well, is ways that you can start to uh, use your valuable voice to stand in your power. The first is, the story I'm telling myself about this is, so when somebody tells you something that might have offended you, let's say, remember, you're giving meaning to what just happened. And so taking responsibility for the meaning you're giving is very powerful. When I say to someone, hey, Charlotte, so you just said this thing, and the story I'm telling myself is that you don't like what I'm wearing today. And she can say, oh my gosh, no, or no, yeah, no, I don't really like what you're wearing. But either way, I'm taking responsibility for the story I'm telling about what she said, right? When we project, when we throw things back to you, like you just said that and that offended me, we usually get defensiveness back. But when we take responsibility, like, you know what, I'm, this is what I'm hearing. Is this what you meant? It leaves that open room for somebody to say, oh gosh, no, that's not what I meant at all, right? Or yes, that's exactly what I meant. Either way, we have clarification. <laughs> and that's really what we're looking for. Tell me more and help me understand are also really helpful when somebody might be going down a direction that you may not like, but you want to stay neutral. <laughs> You keep telling me, you keep talking. The other thing that's great about that is sometimes people catch themselves. If you have them telling you more, they might start to hear themselves and go, oh, wow, no, I'm really creating not such a great thing here, right? Or maybe I'm not being clear. Or maybe I need to add more information here. Uh, and then finally, when we're in, I love this last one. This is one of my favorites when it comes to situations. I'm not a big drama person. I don't, I don't like to talk about people behind their backs. I don't like to deal with drama dynamics. And when people are talking about, let's say, a situation or someone else, and I don't want to be a part of it, right? Instead of just staying quiet, I actually like, you know, that's interesting. That hasn't been my experience with that person at all. This has been my experience with that person, right? I get to stay in my truth while not disqualifying theirs, okay? That might be their truth, but they had a difficult 
I'm a bad person. But it also neutralizes a situation where I'm not going to go along with something that I may not agree with. Okay, so all of this, there's a lot more in there um, on how to approach these conversations. And finally, I wanted to leave you with three of my favorite quotes on communication. The first one, George Bernard Shaw once said, the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it's taking place. So making sure that we are intentional in our communications, hopefully all of the things that, we talk, that I talked about today will help. And that is that when we're truly leaning into building trust, rapport, and connection, we are going to be communicating in some way, right? Effective communication is 20% what you know and 80% how you feel about what you know. That was Jim Rohn, right? And remembering that oftentimes what we're responding or reacting to is how we feel, right? Not what we're thinking, right? So making sure that our communications are in alignment with, with how we're feeling, but also how we want other people to feel is really important. And then finally, communication works for those who work at it. So hopefully today's pointers and tips will be helpful for you to work on your communication. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Do you have online questions? I don't have any yet. Not none yet. Okay. Are there any questions in the middle? I'll step back to if there are points. Yes. Any advice on what to do if you've been ghosted? If you've been ghosted, that's actually really great. Um, you know, so ghosting is is one of the, the worst things that can happen a lot of times, and not just from if we're waiting for actual information or we need something from someone, but closure, right? Again, when we haven't had closure in things, things leave kind of flapping in the wind, and that also makes us feel very insecure in situations. So one of the best ways I find, because again, we can only take responsibility for our peace, like I said earlier. Is, is to be absolutely honest. You know, one of the biggest questions people say to me is like, how would I say this? I'm like say, say exactly what, you, what you're thinking. <laughs> find, find a respectful way to do it, but don't try to sugarcoat it. You know, that uh, if the situation, it depends on the situation. I don't know what, what the situation is or if you wanted to share it, but you know, typical ghosting situations, sometimes it's people just forgot. How many times have I heard, oh, I thought I sent you that email. So sorry. <laughs> I just saw, I still see it in my inbox <laughs> or my, my sent box or my unsent box. So sometimes people just overlook it. But if it's actually a situation where you have been left hanging for a while and it's something that is still bothering you, reach out and just tell, tell the person, you know, I've been waiting to hear from you. I haven't heard from you. Um, I don't know if I will hear from you. This is not a demand that I do, but I just want you to know how that, how I'm feeling about that, right? Because the situation matters to me, right? And, and so I would like to get some closure on this if that's okay. Um, so if, um, I like the last quote where you said, um, you know, effective communicator is the practice of it. So like, if I, yeah, communication works for those who work at it. So it takes like some daily or some sort of effort. Um, how do you start? I mean, like I'm, I'm communicating now, but like, you know, you have a lot of books, you know, Coach, or you know, like, how does one say, okay, I, I want to set this in a right for myself to see if it works right for me? That's such a great question. Thank you for that. Well, first of all, the power of intention is, is, is kind of like, you know, not, not solid as this response might sound. When you simply create an intention to be a better communicator, that's where you start. You start with the power of intention. I also love intentional statements. I write them all the time. I'm always working off of these three at any one time. You know, what are my intentions, right? For this, this, this talk, this week, this month, right? Some people call them goals, but the difference I see between goals and intentions is intentions are who do I want to be? Goals are what do I want to do, right? So I have intentions for goals. <laughs> um, but yeah, it depends on what kind of person you are. I mean, some people are, are more verbal, um, and that's great to talk to someone. I, a lot of my clients, that's why they hired me as a coach. They really want accountability for one, but also somebody who can lead them in a direction because we don't know what we don't know. Right? So when we're working with somebody who knows more than we do, <laughs> it helps get us there. Um, but reading books, if you're a book reader, that's a great way to go as well. I mean, some of the books I, you know, I shared with you are some of my favorites, but there's a whole slew of great books on communication out there. Um, but also, too, just asking people, you know, closest to you. 
how, how, you know, how is my communication with you? Is there anything? I, I do this all the time. I have a 14 year old daughter. So uh, you can only imagine, you know, if communication is very important. And I ask her all the time, you know, how am I communicating with you, Patty? Is this landing well? Am I, do you feel, do you feel heard, supported, loved? You know, and I'll just, I'll just ask. Um, and so you can get great feedback from those closest to you too. And if you, you say, or just have an accountability buddy in your, in your close circle. I'm really trying to work on my communication. Would you try to be my accountability buddy and tell me how I'm doing? There's a lot of ways. That's really good because as you were saying that, like my anxiety level went up just a little bit because at any criticism or just constructive feedback, you know, it's like, oh my God, so fine. But obviously it's, it's necessary to be an effective communicator because I do not know how I'm coming across, my intentions are going to be good. Or that's that's good. You like that? That's great. <laughs> awesome. Yay. We have we hit something. Well, and, and again, I appreciate you saying that because you know, with most of the leaders that I work with, you can only imagine, you know, leaders are the people everybody are looking up to and they're expecting them, you know, to already be good at these things. And so just admitting to me, even behind closed doors, that they don't feel that they're very good as, in their communications, but then being able to be transparent and vulnerable in front of their people, it it, it does take a little bit of time. But again, like Renee Brown said, you know, when she was waiting to become bulletproof and near perfect before she entered the amphitheater, she realized that once she got in center stage, that's not what people wanted from her. Nobody can, can connect with bulletproof and perfect. None of us are, right? So when we allow our true selves to be shown, that's where we really have the impact. And when we say, you know, I'm working on it, that really has people responding to us differently. Like now, if we make mistakes, the first thing they're thinking is because that's building trust, rapport, and communication or connection. You know, now they're like, oh, well, she's working on it though. You know, I can give her that feedback. It's okay. Like, much more willing to kind of let that slide when they know that we we're working towards it. Yes. Uh, this is from Lisa. She wants to know how to handle the power of ten. Yeah. So that's one of that book I mentioned, the power of head, that is the best book for that because the disempowered dynamics when people are in passive aggressive. So just to give a, a little bit of, of that work um, because it's so powerful. So anybody that's in victim mentality and when we're in victim mentality, this is what we're doing, right? So when we're thinking, oh gosh, I'm, you know, I, this has been done to me. We're in victim and a victim looks out into the world and sees two things. They see who's perpetrating me or who or what and who or what needs to fix it. Because as a victim, I have no, I, I have no ability to do anything myself. And I'm completely, you know, in order to stay victim, I, I can't do anything for myself. And so they're always looking at positioning people in one of those two uh, roles. Sometimes both, right? Sometimes people can try to put you in both. You did this to me and I want you to fix it, right? You perpetrated and you need to rescue me. So they can be doing that. That's usually what passive aggressive behavior is. So when somebody is passively being that victim, you know, like save me, save me, save me, and then aggressive, like you need to fix it, right? That is disempowerment, right? And the best way to deal with that is actually question. When somebody's coming at you passive aggressively, put it back in their court. So what is it that you need? So what is it you're trying to say? So what would be a good outcome here for you? Right? Put it back in their court. When somebody's coming back at you, it's about them, remember. And if you really want to show up for them and be supportive of them and be that coach in that triangle of empowerment, what do coaches do? They ask a lot of questions, right? We don't fill things in for people. We ask them questions so they can discover things for themselves. So that's that's one of the things that, that I would recommend. Yeah, this one's from Brianna. She said, I'm in a time Chicago, Texas has helped some like their communication and Yeah, that's a great one. So the workplace stuff can be a little bit more challenging depending again on our, our, um, our level of trust, rapport, and connection with the person we're talking to, <laughs> which is why building it when things are not challenging is so important. You know, it's like putting money in the bank for when we need it. Um, when we build those things, when it comes to these opportunities, and I look at them as opportunities, um, to, to communicate to somebody I always start with, so I am saying this not from a place of not doing this myself. In fact, I like to leave with 
but stories. Let me tell you about the time that somebody chose not to work with me because I was acting too perfect. That was a real life story. I did a presentation and somebody wanted to possibly work with me and told me afterwards that they didn't want to work with me because I was too perfect. And I will actually lead in with stories myself. I mean, even the workplace environments where it's manager talking to employee or other manager, you know, when you can put that other person at ease knowing you're not coming at them, you're not expecting them to be perfect. In fact, you make the same mistake yourself and you're coming from a place of experience, not from a place of expectation. That can really offset a lot of the uncomfortable part of it. Um, but also leading with, you know, Culture of companies is important. And you know, this is why I talk to a lot of companies about core values. And do you lead with your core values? And do your people know your core values? And or do you use your core values to, to create the, the company culture actively that you have? Because you can use these a lot too. When you're talking in workplace environments, you know, our company culture, you know, is this and what we're really trying to breed, especially with diversity, equity, and inclusion, you know, is this place of safety. You know, people have to feel safe at work to some extent. I mean, it's not our job to go above and beyond. I mean, it, it, it takes two. But we also don't want to create scenarios where people are not feeling valued and they don't feel that their, their voices is heard. And so, you know, sometimes, you know, in our communications, we can unintentionally do that. And so you kind of lead in by setting the stage, not making it so much about that person, but making it more about the about the company culture, about the department culture, about the team culture, whatever it happens to be that you're addressing, if this is a team person, you know, you know, our team, we've done so much to, you know, in this challenging time to come together. And, you know, one of the things that that I know is more important than ever is building that trust, rapport, and connection. And sometimes when we just come across transactionally, you know, I think it, it might be heard a certain way. So we we start to use that language to set the stage. So we're not coming straight at that person. And then if the person's like, okay, what are you saying about this? Well, you know, I know that sometimes I've noticed, you know, or I have some feedback. Are you open to hearing it? That's a great intro to giving somebody feedback. I'm hired to be a coach to tell people what I hear, but I always ask, right? Would you like to know what I hear? With every single one of my clients, every single time, I always ask first, even though that's what I'm hired for, right? Asking for permission to share feedback is respectful. Hopefully that helps. <laughs> Are you just, oh, just, I just, just get it. I, I just see the hand. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> I, just, I just have the, the mic and camera. Yeah. I know a lot of the nuance of communication can get lost in things like text, email, Slack. So let's say you find yourself in a place where you're going back and forth with someone, and all of a sudden you realize, oh shoot, they think I'm being the aggressor or something has been miscommunicated on my part. How do you sort of stop that vicious cycle and be like, back up, I actually do want to offer trust and rapport, but I feel like I've gotten so far down this wormhole that I don't know what to say to make you trust me. Exactly what we just said. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as soon as, and that's, that's building transparency too. And you know, again, to the, to the perfection thing, when we see that someone's willing to be that transparent and that vulnerable and say, I just realized I have, can we restart this? <laughs> can we just do a redo? <laughs> that right there says so much to me about that person, right? I want to build trust and rapport and connection with that person, right? When they're trying to kind of dance around it, I mean, in, in my world, I know when people are dancing around stuff. <laughs> you know, so I'm just kind of like, let's not dance. What do you really want to say? You know, because again, direct communication is respectful, right? If I really care about you, and I always say that, I'm saying this because I care about you. If I didn't care about you, I probably wouldn't put the effort in, right? I care so much. I'm so passionate about this because this relationship matters to me. And this relationship can be a personal one or a work-related one. When we're able to say that to people, even at work, like this relationship matters to me because it is a relationship. I mean, as much as we, you know, it's kind of like division of church and state. We don't talk about relationship at work. You know, that's a little bit weird. We're in relationship with everything, right? When we make it weird, it becomes weird. When we don't make it weird, it isn't weird. <laughs> or at least we get more normalized in it, right? So then eventually it doesn't become weird. But knowing that that's what it is about. It's about our relationships with one another and how we want to manage those. So yeah, exactly what you said. Beautiful. <laughs>
right? And that's when it starts to come through the emails. A lot of times the reason we don't feel that in emails is because we don't talk the same in emails as we do when we're face to face. When we start to talk in emails the way we do face to face, that's the same. Thank you. That's a great question. Uh, this is from Lisa. Any advice on what to say to someone who is constantly critical of you and yeah, that's a great one. So one of the things that I always like to do is feed back to people, like do the mirroring thing. So if they're being critical, it's like, so let me just uh, get clear on what I'm hearing from you. And you literally feed them back what they've just said to you, right? So if they've made a critical comment, it's like, okay, so I'm, I'm hearing this. Let me just make sure I'm hearing this correctly. What you're saying is that you think, you know, I should cut my hair and that it's too long and, and why are you looking? Is that what you're saying? Okay. <laughs> I'm all about hitting it back in their court, right? Again, what that does is it clarifies too. Because, you know, one, it mirrors half the time when people are being critical, it's completely unconscious. Completely unconscious. Probably the way they were raised, okay? That's all they know, okay? And again, I, I, I remember one time, I don't remember if it came up in a book, but in for one of her books or one of her talks, but when I, Renee Brown was talking about her husband and how he said, you know, I really believe people are doing their best. She said, how do you know that? He says, I don't, but it makes me feel better believing so, <laughs> right? If we really believe, if we're doing our best, and I assume somebody else is doing their best, then I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt that I'm going to clear, right? So, and, and, and again, I also like to ask people what they're, what they're shooting for, you know, especially when you're in those conversations where you can tell the person just wants to be right. Be like, where are we taking this? Like, what is the ultimate outcome that you see in this conversation? Right, and that usually gets people to stop, you know, because again, if we're just trying to be right, we don't care about building trust, rapport, and connection. We just want to be right. But again, we're doing that unconsciously. So a lot of times, it's when they can point that out. And my, my daughter does this to my all. You can only imagine what it's like living in my household, you know, with a fourteen-year-old. You know, she hears me talking about these things, and then she uses it against me, right? Which is fantastic because it keeps me accountable. Um, but that's that's the kind of thing she she will tell me all the time. She's like, you know, mom, you know that thing that you always talk about? Yeah, you're doing it. Thank you. <laughs> We're not perfect, right? We're human. And I think that's part of it too, that even if somebody's coming at you, you can say, you know, I know we're all human. I'm not trying to make this difficult. In fact, I'm trying to clarify this because this relationship matters to me. I use that agnostic. Because <laughs> it does. My relationships matter. Anything else? No? We're full, huh? I always say that I like to, I'm not a very big one on, on um, standing ovations, although I'm not going to turn one down. But what I do believe is, is that when we come together as people, you know, when we can hear a pin drop, what does that mean? It means that whatever we're hearing, we're so deep in thought. And if we're deep in thought, it means we're taking it in. If we took taking it in, it means it's valuable to us, right? So for me, it's that idea of when there's silence like this, it means you're thinking. And that means what you're doing is valuable, right? What I just delivered is valuable. So that's enough. <laughs> so thank you for any more questions. Thank you.